Hello, Year 13, it's Mr. Azapardi with a video about Ludwig Wittgenstein and language games. So, um, yeah, this is part of the um, the last unit in philosophy, the Religious Language 20th Century Perspectives Unit. Um, it comes after A.J. Eyre and then the stuff we looked at on falsification, which we haven't yet finished, but we're going to come back to. Um, yeah, this is some complicated philosophy. There's quite a lot in here. It might be good that we're covering it in this video because because it's complicated. It's sometimes good to go back over it. So, uh, you know, um, do take your time over it. Do um, make sure you, you, you're trying to look at it in depth because it is quite complicated for you to understand it. But once you get it, you get it with Wittgenstein. Uh, OK, uh, so we're going to what we're going to do is I'm going to look at three sections. I'm going to look at who uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein is. Um, we can look at his early philosophy, which is uh, the, which influenced people like A.J. Eyre, and then we're going to look at his later philosophy. Um, before that, we're going to just do a little overview on what we've done so far in this particular unit. So yeah, this unit is the uh, Religious Language 20th Century Perspectives uh, unit. And uh, we're just going to take a look at where we are so far. So. The first person we looked at with this unit was uh, A.J. Eyre, and he's the one who kind of raises the main questions that this unit is looking at. So here's what Eyre said. Eyre said, he said to be meaningful, a statement must be either be analytic or synthetic, which just means not analytic, and verifiable using empirical evidence. So he says that statements about God are not analytic. They're not true by definition. And they cannot be verified. Therefore, all religious language is meaningless nonsense. Just meaningless. Not true or false. It just doesn't mean anything. That's what he said. However, there's a big problem with air. First, air was never able to define precisely what it means for something to be verifiable. This is the whole problem of like what counts as good evidence. And he, it was complicated what we talked about here. But the basics of this is that he was never able to argue that He's never been able to prove that there's no evidence that counts in favour of religious statements. Because some people might say, well, what about religious experiences? Some people say they've had religious experiences. Is that not good evidence? He would say it wasn't good evidence, but he wasn't able to precisely define what's good evidence and what's not good evidence. And so that's a problem when, you're, when your whole uh, idea rests on that. More important was the fact that the verification principle fails its own test. The verification principle is not analytically true and it's not verifiable through through um, sense experience or sense evidence. So what does it mean? It, it basically means that air is just saying that something's meaningless if it can't be verified, but he's not proved it. So what conclusion can we draw with air? Well, the verification principle does not prove that religious language is meaningless, but it does raise an interesting question. If we can't verify religious claims, what kind of meaning do they have? Because it seems they're very different in meaning from ordinary claims like it's raining outside, which is clearly meaningful and we can go and test whether it's true or not. The second thing we looked at was uh, flu and his idea of falsification. Uh, now, we're still looking at this. Um, so I'll talk you through it, uh, but we will come back to it. So flu was influenced by Popper. Popper said that to be scientifically meaningful, we must be able to say of a statement what it would take for it to be falsified. So it must be in theory falsifiable. That doesn't mean that you have to be able to prove it wrong because that would mean that only wrong things were meaningful. What it means is you need to be able to say what well, in which what kind of evidence, if we got that evidence, would prove it wrong. Now, Flew applied this to religion. Statements like God is love cannot be falsified, he said, because religious believers will always explain away any evidence that suggests the statement is false. So, you know, we say God is love and we say, well, that's falsifiable because we could say if God is love, he would never send an earthquake to kill innocent people. But he does send it. So from that point of view, you might say, well, it's been falsified. But religious believers, of course, always say, well, God's transcendent or it's to do the sin of Adam and Eve or something to explain it away. And what Flew is saying is, no matter how good evidence you give to falsify this statement, God is love, religious believers will never accept it. Therefore, he says, religious language is not scientifically meaningful because it can't be falsified. There's no way you can falsify it. 
Now, Flew thought that religious people treat religious statements as what he calls genuine assertions. This means that they think that religious statements say something real and definite about the, uni the nature of the world, like there is a God out there who is loving. In this sense, he says, that religious language is a form of scientific language, you know, in the same way that science might say uh, there is a force called gravity. Religion is saying there is this being called God. And therefore, these two things together, it can't be falsified. It's acting in a scientific way. Flew says religious language is meaningless by its own standards. It wants to be taken to be saying something true about the universe. It can't be falsified. Therefore, it's meaningless. Now, Flew has been criticised in many ways. Uh, and which we've looked at and we'll look at again. However, Wittgenstein can be seen as a possible response to flu. Um, because flu is saying religious language is some kind of scientific style language. It's saying something true about the universe. But maybe religious language is not scientific language. Maybe religious language is something completely different to scientific language and is working in a completely different way. Now, if that is true, then maybe religious language is meaningful, just not meaningful in a scientific way. And that's what we're going to look at in this uh, video. So three parts on Wittgenstein, who he was, his early philosophy and his later philosophy. Let's just go through who he was. We saw that Wittgenstein was at, at school with Hitler, um, an interesting historical fact about him. So uh, Wittgenstein lived from 1889 to 1951. Um, he was Austrian. He came from a very uh, rich family, but he gave a lot of money away. He came to the UK as an engineering student, um, but he became interested in philosophy instead and studied with Bertrand Russell, a very famous person. You probably know him from the cosmological argument and the debate he had with Copleston. Um, he served in the Austro-Hungarian army during World War One. That meant he, even though he was studying in the UK, he was on the other side of the uh, war. He worked as a teacher and as a gardener for a monastery. Uh, he did some interesting jobs. He was, by all accounts, quite a strange uh, dude. He also taught at Cambridge University. And his ideas can be divided into two different philosophies. Whether these philosophies are, uh, what's the word, against each other, or whether one is just a development of the first one is a matter of debate. Now, he had, Wittgenstein, a very big influence on the Vienna Circle, uh, who we've talked about when we talked about air, and logical positivism, that very kind of, this idea of philosophy, which very much saw the world in scientific terms, all about empiricism. However, unlike uh, the Vienna Circle, and unlike A.J. Eyre, he saw himself as a religious person, and he was influenced by the religious writings of Leo Tolstoy, a very famous Russian uh, author. When he met the Vienna Circle, who were all big fans of his, they were confused by him because they expected this very rational and scientific kind of person. But he spoke more like an artist or a mystical religious thinker than a rational person. So it's interesting. And this will come up again, this idea that he's got some things in common with people like A.J. Eyre, but also he's got important differences. OK, second section, his early philosophy. So Wittgenstein's first philosophy is found in his book Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. Sounds like uh, something Harry Potter might say, but it is his book, 1921. Um, now this book influenced again a circle in logical positivism, and there are certain similarities between there are definitely similarities between Wittgenstein's ideas and those of Ayer and other logical positivists. However, there are also important differences. Wittgenstein felt that the Vienna Circle had misunderstood his ideas. So here's what he says in that book. Wittgenstein is, was interested in how we communicate meaning through language. He argued that language works by creating a picture of reality. For example, the cat sat on the mat creates a picture in my mind of a cat sitting on a mat. So that's what he says language is doing. When you say a sentence to someone, you put a picture in their mind using words. A statement in language can be true or false, depending on whether the picture it gives corresponds with reality. So if I say there's a cat on the mat, you can go and look at the mat. If there's a cat there, then what I said was true. 
Now, apart from tautologies, things true by definition, and mathematical statements, there, that's his way, that's a, another way of talking about analytical statements. Only statements that picture something in the world which can be checked against reality are meaningful. Now, this is exactly what Eyre is saying in the verification principle, right? Things that are true uh, by definition, analytic statements are meaningful, and things that can be checked against reality are meaningful. But if it's not analytic and it can't be kept against reality using empirical evidence, it's not meaningful. Ethical and religious statements are therefore outside of what can meaningfully, we can meaningfully communicate in language. So in this early philosophy, he is saying we cannot c communicate meaningfully truths about religion and ethics. He said, what can be said at all can be said clearly. And what we cannot talk about, we must pass over in silence. So he's saying, look, if you can clearly say something, which is the meaning of which is completely clear, and we can check it against reality, then it's meaningful. Otherwise, um, we just shouldn't say anything about it. Things about, and, and he would say, things about religion and ethics fall into this category. We can't say anything about them that's clear and can be verified. Therefore, we must just not talk about them. Now, here comes the difference, though, between logical positivists. And when I say logical positivists, I mean the Vienna Circle and A.J. Eyre. Maybe it's best just to think as logical positivists as A.J. Eyre here, because he's the main person we've talked about who represents that idea. So logical positivists thought that things outside the realm of meaningful language are unimportant. So religious stuff, ethics, just meaningless, just throw it in the bin. But Wittgenstein disagreed. He used the phrase the mystical to refer to things which cannot be communicated in language. This includes religious truths and ethics. For Wittgenstein, the mystical is very important. It cannot be expressed meaningfully in language, but it may be more important than things that we can express in language. So things like religion and ethics were important. They weren't just garbage. They can't be expressed meaningfully in language, but they're still very important. Here's a quote about to express this idea from a, a philosopher called Paul Engelman. Positivism, that's what AJR thinks, holds, and this is its essence, that what we can speak of is all that matters in life. So anything that you can't communicate in language is, in, is not important. It's just meaningless, we throw it away. Whereas Wittgenstein passionately believes that all that really matters in life is precisely what, in his view, we must be silent about. So the really important things in life are the things you cannot communicate in language I mean, if you think about it there's you know you can understand what he's saying here right because is there a god what's right and wrong how should we live our life these questions which are very difficult to uh, talk about and certainly you can't uh, express in um, language that can be verified empirically are some of the biggest and most important questions in life here's a little summary then of what he said to be meaningful language must create a picture in the mind uh, which can be checked against reality this is very similar to the verification principle. In the early philosophy, Wittgenstein agrees with Eyre that religion is outside of what we can meaningfully, what can be meaningfully communicated in language. But unlike Eyre, Wittgenstein saw things which cannot be communicated meaningfully in language as extremely important. There we go. There's the early philosophy. We're on to the later philosophy. So, I mean. Uh, Wittgenstein, it was interesting to read all about him Wittgenstein, because he basically uh, quit philosophy after writing that first book because he felt like he'd completed it. I mean, he wasn't a person who was short of um, uh, self-confidence when it came to his own philosophical intelligence. So he thought that he had basically written the complete book of philosophy and no one needed to write anything more. However, he changed his mind and he wrote a second book, which was published in 1953. That's, uh, let me just check. I think that's after he, yeah, just after he died. Uh, it was published, although he had um, lectured about it and spoken about it a lot before that. So um, he wrote this book, Philosophical Investigations, in 1953. Uh, why, why was I looking up whether it happened after he died? It says on the slide. Um, so this was his new philosophy. So we have this new set of ideas that he put across this philosophy. Now, some see this philosophy as going entirely against his early views. Others see it as a development, just building on his early views. He now argues that the picture theory describes only one form of language. That is the language of the natural sciences, scientific language, which is based on picturing the world and checking our pictures against empirical reality. So he is now said he used to think that was everything in language was based on that. 
paint a picture in people's minds with your words and then check it against reality. However, now he says, no, that is simply one form of language, the scientific form of language. He says there are actually other forms of language which work in different ways. Now, he says a statement may be meaningless according to the rules of scientific language, but may still be meaningful according to another form of language. OK, we've got to get into this and understand what he means. To do that, we need to look at the world of games because Wittgenstein uses the, the concept of language games. And so he's using the metaphor of games. Now, if we were in the class, we'd ask this question. What do these games have in common? Now, the, the answer is um, not that much, I would say, right? Um, because if you look at, you've got rugby and football, those two games. Now, they involve some kind of ball, but none of the other games involve a ball. You've got chess and, uh, let me think, chess you play on your own, whereas all the others are being played with someone else, either with two people or with a team. Um, you could say chess and uh, I think that's um, pointless, the game show, um, and football and rugby have winner. But then Ring of Ring of Roses is still a game, uh, but it doesn't have a winner. Um, so this is an odd thing, right? Games, are, we know what games are, um, but they're all different. They've got different rules. There's, they've got things in, there's things in common between different games, but you can't really give a definition of a game overall. It's an interesting metaphor. So why is language like a game? He says for two reasons. One, there are lots of different forms of language, but there's no single theory of meaning which they all have in common. So uh, he is saying here that there's lots of different languages, ways in which we use language, different kinds of language. We'll get into that in a minute, what that means. But there are lots of different kinds of language, but how you use words in different ways, in different forms of language is different. Secondly, different forms of language have different rules of what we can be said meaningfully. He refers to different forms of language as language games. Now, when he says different forms of language, he doesn't mean like different languages like English, Spanish, French, so on and so on. What he means is different ways in which language are used. So here's some examples. Scientific language we've talked about, right? It's based on giving very clear descriptions of reality and then checking them against empirical evidence. Jokes. Now, jokes, you don't need, jokes don't need to be empirically verified. They are based on using various techniques to make people laugh. Exclamations. If you stub your toe and shout, ow, that's not something you can verify, but it's still meaningful because it's a way of expressing uh, emotion. Poetry. It can't be, it's not a verifiable form of language, but it's extremely meaningful to people. Giving orders. If you tell someone to do things, you must take out the uh, rubbish is not a, um, something you verify, the word should, but it's a command, it's got a meaning. So his point here is that we use language in lots of different ways. It's used in different ways to do different things. If you tell someone a joke, you're doing something different to describing what you can see outside of the window. If you are tell giving someone an order, you're doing something different to reading them a poem uh, that you've recently written. It looks the same because you're using words, but it's actually different. The way you use words is different. The way you communicate something, things within those games are different. Now, Wittgenstein goes on to say is that the meaning of a word is determined by its use within a language. In other words, its meaning depends on how it's used within a particular language game. Now, a statement is meaningful or not meaningful within a language game it's being used in. A statement may be meaningful in one language game or meaningless in another. So let's have a look at an example. We can see how things have a different meaning here. If you say, that's a great try, and you're a commentator for rugby, then the person has done really well and scored some points, right? Because a try is the way you score points in rugby. However, if you say the same in a football commentary, um, it means the person's been unsuccessful. They've had a good attempt but they've missed the goal. It's a good try, but he didn't do well. So there you can see the word, the different language game, the language game of rugby commentary and the language game of football commentary, the word try has a different meaning. Than it. <coughs> Another example, the word ow is meaningless in the language game of natural sciences. If you just shout ow in a scientific uh, 
uh, lecture or something doesn't mean anything. There's nothing you can check against empirical evidence. However, in the language game of exclamations, shouting things in pain, it means something because it's expressing the pain that you're feeling. So the meaning of words and phrases all depends on the context in which you're using them. It's um, it's uh, it's all about that situation. You know, if you think of a joke, if uh, if you think of the joke, knock knock, who's there? Doctor, Doctor Who. You just said it, right? That's a joke, not a very good one. But the point is, outside of the world of jokes, that is absolute meaningless nonsense. Like, what are you talking about? But within the world of jokes, it means something because it's an attempt to make people laugh. So here we might try and think of words and phrases that have different meanings in different situations, like a cricket bat or a vampire bat or all those kind of things like that. But we can see that idea, right, that words get their meaning within a particular form of language they're being used in. Now, he goes on to look at what the difference between surface and depth grammar. This is really important. So he says, to understand the meaning of words and statements, we need to know the difference between surface and depth grammar. The surface grammar of a statement is the meaning that a statement appears to have at first sight without taking into account the language game within, its, within which it is being used. The depth grammar of a statement is its meaning within a particular language game. Now, sometimes the surface and depth grammar will be the same. Sometimes what people are saying is completely obvious and completely makes sense. And you don't have to look at it in too much detail. But in other situations, you need to look more deeply. Here's some examples. A parent says to a worried child, everything is going to be fine. Now, the surface grammar is that the parent is making a prediction about the future. The parent knows that everything is going to be fine. But of course, the parent doesn't know everything's going to be fine. The depth grammar is this. The statement is being used within the parent-child reassurance language game to comfort the child and make them feel better. It is not a real prediction of what the parent thinks will happen. So there we go. An example of surface and depth grammar. <coughs> you know, an alien from another planet who might have never seen the way we use language might think on the surface when they see a parent saying that, wow, this parent can see into the future. What amazing skills and abilities humans have. But we know, because we know the way in which language works, that the parent is not making any kind of prediction. Even the child knows that the parent's not making a prediction, but it's just a way of reassuring in that situation. So let's have, here's, again, we can't do this because we're on video, but here's some examples. What is the depth grammar here? If you say to a waiter, would you bring me a cup of coffee? Now, on the surface, it seems to be saying that we're make, asking a question. But uh, we're not asking a question. It's a command. It's just a polite way of making a command. So in the uh, language game of uh, how you speak to people in restaurants, uh, that means uh, bring me a cup of coffee. Um, if uh, if uh, 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 what's the word? a parent is told by a teacher that the child has misbehaved at school, the parent might say, I'm going to kill him when he gets home now. Surface grammar, they're going to actually kill their child. Depth grammar, they're going to tell them off. It's just a way of more, um, what's the word? Strongly expressing the fact the kid's going to get told off. F uh, next one, football commentary. It might be raining, but the sun is, sun is still shining on English football today. Now, the, again, imagine you're alien looking at the, came, came to earth. Here's this commentary on the radio and he pictures it. Wow. Even though it's raining in whichever place England are playing football, on the actual stadium where they're playing football, it's the sun is shining and it's not raining on that particular place. That's well, a miracle. But no, that's not what it means. It means though it's a rainy day, uh, things are going well in English football. England are winning in that game. So in all these situations, we can see that the surface meaning of a statement might not be the same as what it actually means within a particular language game. You've got to understand the context in which it happens for it to be meaningful. OK, so far, we should be clear. Forms of life, this one a little bit trickier to understand. So that the second on forms of life is a little bit tricky to understand. So. Wittgenstein argues that language games are based in what he calls forms of life. These are the ways in which people live their lives. Each language game is based on the way of life of a particular community. The way we use language grows out of the way in which we live. 
Because they are part of forms of life, language games do not need to be justified, he says. Language games make sense within particular ways of living. The meaning of language does not need to be justified using empirical evidence when it already has meaning within a particular community's way of life. So, for example, statements like everything is going to be fine has meaning and uh, usefulness within forms of life of particular parents and children. We do not have to prove it is empirically true for it to have this meaning. Now, what does this mean? So what he's trying to say here, Wittgenstein, is if we look back to Air, where Air said that, um, you know, statements are meaningless if they can't be verified. Wittgenstein would say, yes, that, that's true in science, because science is a particular way of life, a particular community, the scientific community, who's, who wants to find out particular facts about the world, and therefore they use language in this very exact way. It has to be verified. Outside of that, it's meaningless. However, he says that, that that's, that's just one way of using language. In other communities, language is used in other ways because it is useful to use it in those ways in that community. So, it is, for example, it's uh, useful when the child is upset to be able to calm them down. It makes the child happier, makes the parent happier. It's the parent's job to do that. And so, like, we can't say that these lang we can't say about the claim everything's going to be fine or prove it or it's meaningless because its meaning is the fact that it helps people in their life. So this is what he's trying to say. He's trying to say. Our language, the language we use, doesn't to it, for it to be meaningful. It doesn't have to be proved empirically. It doesn't. We don't need any empirical proof because the very fact that we use it within our communities, within our particular way of life, means that it is useful in those particular way of life. We wouldn't use it if it wasn't meaningful to us within the lives that we lead. Now, why does he talk about communities and ways of life? Because what he's trying to say is that different communities and different uh, who have different ways of life will use language differently. That's like language changes over time because um, as the way in which we live uh, changes and the things we believe and all those things change, then language changes with it to become meaningful in the new ways that we, we live. So the whole idea here is that He's trying to show that language doesn't need to be verified to be meaningful. Language is meaningful when it's used in a particular way in within, within the community because, um, because it makes sense to those people in that time. It has a meaning for those people. Even if it can't be verified, it's meaningful to those people. Otherwise, they wouldn't be using it. I, to give an example of this, um, uh, to show like how how these things work i've got this i've gone back to richard swinburne's example richard swinburne when he criticized aj air wanted to say that this statement has meaning and the statement was the toys in my cupboard come to life at night dance around and then go back in the cupboard as soon as i wake up now i think from Wittgenstein point of view that would actually be a largely meaningless statement because it hasn't been made within a any particular language game it doesn't seem to me he's just said it he's just picked it randomly i suppose it's kind of part of the uh, language game of philosophy because he's arguing with aj air but it's not kind of part of the way of life of the community it's just a kind of random statement but have a look on the other side bob and june are an old married couple june is worried she is losing her memory she often forgets where her keys and purse are bob always says the grandchildren's toys come to life at night and move your things they laugh june is grateful to bob for turning it into a joke and not letting her dwell on her fears now look here i would say a very similar statement but this one seems more meaningful to me from a from wittgenstein's sense that is because um it's it has a me gets its meaning from a very particular language game and uh, kind of way form of life we, it, the language game is the language game played by these two older people um, and it's a language game of kind of humour and reassurance um, uh, when, you know, in the face of growing old that, that he doesn't literally mean um, that the grandchildren at toys come to life and move the things. They are, um, it's, it's just a way of giving her some reassurance or making light of something that she is very worried about to make her feel happier and to move on in their lives. So again, in not, neither case is this something can be verified. But in Richard Swinburne's case, you're just kind of like, well, it hasn't really got any depth grammar. He's not really trying to say anything more deeply there. 
and it's not within a particular community it's not actually doing anything whereas in the second case it's serving a role and a purpose within a particular uh, form of life and it's got this deeper grammar so it has this meaning okay so this is all very interesting but what did Wittgenstein say about religion well he it's difficult because he did not have a complete theory on religion he didn't write a book about what he thought about religion he did make a number of comments about religious language and later thinkers have tried to develop these into full theories of religious language. So we're going to look at some things that he might have said and might have meant. Wittgenstein argues that religious language is meaningless if it's taken to be a form of scientific language, making empirically verifiable statements. Right? It's not that kind of language. However, he does not think that religious language is this kind of language. He does not think religious people are making scientific style statements. Religious language is playing a different language game which is not about making statements of fact. It's not about making factual claims about the world. Some examples can help us to understand this. Wittgenstein criticised the ideas of James Fraser. He was a famous uh, scholar who wrote a book called The Golden Bough. Now, Fraser was interested in the history of religious and magical practices. So he looked at the uh, very early religious practices, like in the history of religion. Now, he, Fraser thought that early forms of religion were failed attempts at science. Right? So, for example, in some ancient religions, people used to make dolls of their enemies and stick pins in them. Um, and uh, Fraser thinks that what they believed, that they believed they could harm their enemies in this way. So you make a little doll. Of your enemy. I mean, we you it used to use the phrase voodoo doll, but I believe that that's an in, inaccurate phrase. That the religion of voodoo is not linked to the making of these dolls, but um, that's what people used to call them. So you um, <coughs> um, you make a doll that looks like the person, and you stick pins in them. And Fraser thought that the reason people used to do that was because they thought it, they thought it was some kind of uh, like magical thing. You can stick a pin in the doll, and it will hurt the person. Now, Wittgenstein says this is wrong. He says people are not that stupid. People didn't, would never thought that if you make a doll of someone and stick a pin in it, it will hurt them. He says that you've got to look at the depth grammar. On the surface, it looks like when they make the doll and stick pins in it, that they think somehow this, this, that um, hurting the doll will hurt the person. But he says the depth grammar is that they what they're doing is expressing certain feelings and satisfying emotional needs. They feel like they don't like this person. This person has victimised them, but they can't do anything against them. Maybe the person is very powerful and so on. So they feel a need to have some outlet for their emotions. So they create this doll and stick pins in it. Can you see how it's depth grammar? There's a different meaning to the surface meaning of a religious practice. If we bring it on to a, 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 a Christian religious practice, Wittgenstein, who was a Christian himself, wrote about the last judgment. So that is the Christian belief that at the end of the world, God, usually in the form, it's said to be in the form of Jesus, will return to the earth and judge everyone, sending some to heaven and some to hell. Now, Wittgenstein argues that belief in the last judgment is not a prediction about what will happen in the future. Instead, he argues, it is a way of expressing commitment to a particular understanding of life, which will guide one's actions in this world. So in other words, it's a way of expressing that you're committed to living a, a life along Christian values. Belief in the judge, last judgment is about commitment to the Christian way of life, not about the facts of what will happen at the end of time. So here's, here's an interesting bit of depth grammar. He is saying when Christians talk about the last judgment, that is not about some uh, factual thing that will happen at the end of time. And that if you travel forward in time, you could verify empirically. No, it is about... You are when you say that God will judge people at the end of time, you are expressing a commitment because obviously think about it. If God's going to judge people at the end of time, the main thing for us then is that we need to be living in the way that God would want so that we can go to heaven when we die or um, avoid hell. But what he is saying is that the real meaning of that statement is not that this is really going to happen. The real meaning is that we are committing to living a good Christian life now. That is what it actually means to believe in the last judgment. It's not about whether there is a last judgment at the end of time and something like that is really going to happen. It's about saying, I'm going to live a Christian life right now. So what can we get from this? Religious language, therefore, expresses an emotional attitude and understanding of life and a commitment to living life according to that understanding. 
it is not a description of the way the world lit is. So therefore, religious statements are non-cognitive. This brings us back to the distinction between cognitive and non-cognitive language we've looked at before. A cognitive statement is a statement about which we can say it's true or false. Like, it is raining today. It's a, that, scientific statements fall into that category. They are things about which you can say they're true or false, and then you can test whether they're true or false. Um, now, someone like A.J. Eyre would, would say that that's what religious language is trying to be. It's trying to be cognitive language because it's trying to say there is a God. And therefore, that should be something we can test. And he, he says that therefore it's meaningless because you can't test it. Wittgenstein is saying, no, religious statements are not about cog making cognitive statements. They're not about saying things about which we can say it's true or false. Instead, they're expressing an emotional attitude and a way of living your life. So when you say there is a God, you might be in a Christian from a Christian sense. You you know, you say if I say there is an all loving God, what you might be saying, what the depth grammar might be that you are committing yourself to living um, a life uh, according to being loving to all people. So in that sense, belief in God is not a statement about there exists in the world out there a God. It expresses a kind of orientation towards the world. I'm, I, uh, I am committed to living um, uh, a life of loving kindness towards all people. That is the real depth grammar of what you're saying there. So we must be careful here, right? It's tempting to think that Wittgenstein was saying we can just replace religious language with other language. So that, in other words, if someone says, I believe in a loving God, you can just say, uh, oh, I, you, what you mean is I am committed to living an ethical life of love towards all people. However, Wittgenstein denies this. He says religious statements are not scientific statements and are non-cognitive, but they cannot be reducible to other forms of statement. You cannot just take out religious language and replace it with um, ethical language, for example. Religious language gives us a particular way of looking at the world. If religious language is lost, this way of looking at the world is lost. It cannot be replaced by any other form of language. So what does he mean here? Wittgenstein is trying to say that you can't just give up religious language because it's got a, it expresses things that you can't express in any other language. If you say, um, I don't know. I'm trying to think of a good example here. If you say God is love or the, the God is the good shepherd or Jesus died for our sins, that that language has a power and a way of expressing emotion that you can't just reduce to some silly statement like I want to be nice to people. There's a depth grammar to it. It doesn't mean what the meaning is not the same as its surface grammar. You're not saying a fact about the world. There is a God out there you are it has a deeper grammar that means something different to what it means on the surface but you can't just give up the religious language because the religious language has this power and ex form and expressiveness that will be lost if you just turned it into a flat statement about ethics here's a quote from Wittgenstein that might help us here religious belief could only be something like a passionate commitment to a frame of reference so it's a passionate commitment. If you're religious, you're incredibly committed to a frame of reference. That means to looking at the world in a particular way. Hence, although it is a belief, it's really a way of living or a way of assessing life. It's passionately holding to, on to this interpretation. So it's a belief, but what he's trying to say here is doesn't, that doesn't mean it's necessarily a belief in the existence of a particular thing. No, it's a particular, uh, it's a belief in holding on to a particular interpretation of the world. So for Christianity, it might be passionately holding on to the idea that the best way of living is through the ideal of agape love, self, selfless love towards all people. Um, or it's a way of assessing life. It's a way of looking at what's a good life and what's a bad life. So the, like, that's where the last judgment comes in. It's not about a belief in a last judgment. It's a belief that a particular way of life is a good life and a particular way of life is a bad life. So it's it, religion, religious language is not about stating facts, 
but about holding on passionately to a particular way of looking at the world and a way of living in the world. Okay, here's a summary of the later philosophy. Language gets its meaning from the way it's used within a particular language game, Wittgenstein says. Scientific language is only one form of language. There are other forms of language and something may be meaningless within this language game of science, but meaningful within another language game. Religious language is meaningful, but not in the scientific sense. It has a meaning within the particular language game that is being played within the community of believers. To understand its meaning, we must look at the depth grammar of religious statements. What they mean not on the surface, but within the religious language game and the religious community. For example, language about God's judgment is meaningful, meaningful not because it is about, about uh, an event which can be observed empirically, but because it allows people to express a commitment to a particular set of ethics and a particular way of living in the world. Now, what I want you to do, firstly, what what does all this say then? Well, what, what Wittgenstein is doing is saying that, OK, maybe religious language cannot be falsified or verified, but that does not mean it's meaningless. It has a perfectly good meaning to the people um, who use it. It's very meaningful for them. It plays a very important role in their lives. The questions, uh, this will raise big questions, whether Wittgenstein is right uh, uh, opens up big questions but for you all I want you to do is use the information I've got given you here to fill in the A3 worksheet that I gave you. Okay thank you very much sorry about the long video.